Hello everyone, welcome to Naomi's Bookshelf. We are here for my next timeless tome, my giant classics review. And this one is of a mammoth of a book that I am so proud of myself that I finished, and that would be War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. Now, as I have said in my wrap-ups, I will do a spoiler-free section first, and I will let you know when I'm getting into spoiler territories. So the first thing that I wanna say about this book, uh, summary-wise, is that it is very complicated, if you haven't caught that yet. It is hugely diverse in storylines. There are so many characters you follow. The cast is huge. It is very interesting, though, because most of them, I don't mix up. I could picture which ones were the rakes, which ones weren't, which ones were the goody two-shoes, and which ones were the villainous characters. They were all very common, but they also none of them are one note. They are all very morally gray or across the board emotions wise you they're not just boring people and I think Tolstoy has a real art at writing characters where you might get two sentences about them but you understand something about their psyche and a way about the way they act in society or the way they react to certain situations it's very interesting now this book also has themes of family uh, as there are three families in this who are the primary focus the Rostovs who I actually double checked and they have four children, I believe. Uh, I say double checked and I just remember they had a second daughter. So they have two daughters and two sons and they are not very good with money. It's quite an apparent factor of their lives. They're always struggling to make their budget balance and they're not really trying to do that anyways. They are counts and countesses, so they're not quite princess and princes, but they are higher up in the aristocratic uh, field. Now you also have Pierre uh, Bolonovsky. <laughs> the Russian last names were really hard to remember. So Pierre. Now Pierre, he is the illegitimate child of a count who, when he died, left all of his property to his illegitimate son Pierre and not the rest of the family, which is quite the scandal. This happens about a hundred pages in, so it's not completely brand new, but in light of the fact it's 1800 pages, I'm not really considering it a spoiler. So, <laughs> so Pierre inherits this estate and he really is not well respected at all. No one cares about him. He's very um, clumsy and socially awkward. He doesn't understand social cues or gestures. He also is made fun of quite a lot and he's described to be overweight and very tall and very awkward looking in, per in his society. So he stands out like a green thumb in every situation and he does not know the world that he has been thrust into as inheriting this estate. Next, you also have Princess Mary and her brother Andre. I read the translation which called him Andrew, so I'll probably just keep referring to him as Andrew. And their father, I don't remember their last name exactly, it's one of those Russian names, but they are in a very delicate situation with their father. These two children are living very different lives. Mary is very pious and very religious. She's very focused on doing what's best for others and loving and keeping support. She's very self-sacrificing. Then you have Andre or Andrew, who he is in the military. He is going to fight in the Napoleonic War, and he leaves his pregnant wife behind with the fam with his father and sister to take care of her while he is off at war. And he is very feeling discontented with life. Basically, he doesn't really feel content in any situation that he's in. And he really is excited to go off to war because of that. So we have these three main families and how they relate to each other and how they relate to them, like those in their immediate circles. It's very interesting. They're all very interwoven throughout the story. And I don't want to say anymore because it would be spoilers then in my opinion, but it is something that I really appreciated those interconnections and how those all play out. There is something about War and Peace that I think is an aging book. I think it ages with you. And I feel like what I read from it and what I got from it this time around, I would get something new and something different in five years, 10 years from now. And I feel like that'd be applicable to many people. I feel like this book just highlights different factors of your of your thoughts or of your beliefs every time you read it. And that was my opinion from the book club that we were meeting in where most of the women we were discussing this with were over 65 and they all had different opinions than me 
And I think that was just probably life experience and how we read the book in characters. So I think this is a book that will age with me if I want to pick it up in the future, which I kind of do to relearn this world again and to see new things through it. Now, War and Peace does contain a lot of war, as the title suggests. It does take place in two main setups. It takes place in peace, which is polite society, hierarchy, aristocratics, all of those high level groups of people. And it's really about them doing their dinner parties and operas and social get events. Meanwhile, you also have the war scenes which are happening at the same time, but they are very bloody and graphic. Um, in some cases, they are not hiding away from the lack of life that's being saved. There is a real strong message in this book about how life is valuable no matter who you are. And this battle took away so many lives or this war took away so many lives. So I felt like that was a really big thing that I got out of this book as well. But there is this huge disconnect and eventually they merge this war and peace connect. And it's very interesting to see these two opposing societies, these two opposing philosophies of life having to converge and people having to realize what is expected of them. So I really enjoyed it uh, for that aspect. Now, fair warnings. Um, like I said, it is a bit graphic when it comes to the war scenes. It is, it is not hiding away any factors. And Leo Tolstoy himself was in the war. So he did have firsthand experience of this. And so it is his uh, own opinion on what happened and he didn't shy away from any details which wasn't really great sometimes. But another thing is about this book is that it is full of philosophy and I didn't mind it. I actually kind of enjoyed seeing things in his perspective. He would talk about how a certain war, like how a war doesn't happen just because of Napoleon's decision. It's Napoleon's decision plus this, plus this, plus this. And Napoleon's decision is just one decision out of a million decisions and a million choices. And so it's not just one person. And so it was interesting seeing his philosophy on war, on life, on what's important throughout the book. Although it did get a little preachy at times, so just fair warning. I hope that doesn't get too bad for it to bog you down then. The one thing about this book is that it is tough to get through certain sections. So you have the peace sections, which I personally found to be very easy to get through, and then the war sections, which were decently easy to get through as well, but there were several battle scenes that would just last forever, and by forever I mean like literally 100 pages, and you'd only get that one battle. And so in that case, I felt like I needed the push of a buddy read to get through. So I was very appreciative that I was reading it with my book club, that we were able to read a section by week and I knew I had to get through that section so I could get to the next week. And I could be at the meeting and discuss it. I mean, I could have gone to the meeting without discussing it, but I didn't want to be spoiled since I had no knowledge of what would happen in War and Peace. So I highly recommend buddy reading it or reading it with a book club over a set period of time if you're going to do it that way, just to push you through those really tough sections or those philosophy sections if you're not enjoying them. So now we're gonna get into the spoilers section. I'm just gonna talk about what I wanna talk about with this section because there's so much to talk about in this book. But I will say I'm giving it a four star and I recommend reading it. But if you do read it, you can skip the last epilogue. There are two, you can skip the last one if you don't wanna read about philosophy. So I recommend it. Now, into spoilers. I honestly am, I was scared to film this video because there's just so much I wanna say, but I don't wanna make this a forever video. And I kind of also just wanna make it wrapping up my thoughts on this reading experience. So I don't know how in depth I'm gonna go, but I'm definitely gonna to touch on some of the things that I picked up on. I guess I'd like to start off with the certain themes that really struck a chord in me. Now, I really understood the theme of forgiveness and the second chances because this book just seemed to contain non-stop uh, there'd be difficult times and then something would change whether it be the death of someone or the freedom of someone um, which often were actually the same thing and then the person left would be would survive this so an example of this would be uh, Princess Mary Mary and Andrew, um, Princess Mary, when her father dies, she was able to be free of his abuse, but then she also has these new opportunities around her. And I felt like that was quite common for many things. There was the death of something, whether it be the death of a relationship or the actual death of a person, 
um, or the death of an opportunity and then suddenly this person would discover a new option or a new freedom in life and so I feel like this book really was about life will never be stagnant you will have these opportunities and things will happen and then they will go away and then you have to wait for the next thing I have to figure out what the next thing is when those opportunities die on you now that was kind of a thing for Natasha as well with Prince Andre or Andrew uh, with him being like destroying their relationship when she was seduced by Alakov and when she I don't know if I'm saying his name right but Alakov is what I've said out of um, but anyways when she's seduced and then Andrew decides to hate her guts basically that's what his decision is mentally even though he has a different heart decision, his heart can't let her go. But when his head says, I'm never going to talk to her again or talk about her again, and then she has this chance to really reevaluate herself and what is she finding important. And she goes through this depression and then she comes through to a spiritual decision. And I think that's quite a common thing in this book as well is how spiritual how faith comes into play for all of these characters. You have Pierre who's dealing with the death of his relationship to with Helene, and then he becomes a Mason right after when he meets a Mason, a Freemason on the train. And then you also have um, Mary who is freed to practice her faith publicly once her father dies. It's just one of those things where I think that kind of comes out also, you find that when Pierre is uh, removed from freedom, when he's turned into a prisoner, he learns the, the freedom in itself of being simple and being just dedicated to God in that way. My ring light just went out. So we're going to continue with some other lights. Anyways, so I think I was on about where Pierre is in prison. Now when Pierre is in prison, um, he meets this fellow prisoner who is a peasant and he is seen as the true version of a peasant, the most amazing peasant. This is the ideal peasant you could have ever met kind of idea. And I don't know if that's quite a fair because Tolstoy didn't really know the peasants. He was an aristocrat, but I did find it interesting how he, I don't know, how he examined the simple life. And I think what I got out of the book, at least this time, was how simple life is most important. You want the simple life and you don't want the drama and the chaos and everything else. You just want the simple life. And that's something that Pierre is striving for the whole time. That's something that Nikolai Rostov discovers when he is married to Princess Mary. And I thought that his arc was really great as well. How he starts off a gambling uh, drunkard and partier and he turns into this man who is very careful with money after he decide, realizes that he is literally broke. He has no money whatsoever after the death of his father and he has to, basically, they're paupers, his family. His mother and his sister are paupers with him and he has to take care of them. And he really learns the hard way, the value of work and efficiency. And then his marriage to Princess Mary saves them financially, but he just never lets go of that simple mentality of work. And I thought that was great. That definitely was a great character arc for him. Pierre also has that similar character arc of being a drunkard and a womanizer. Even though he's not very attractive, he's rich enough to attract women. And then he turns into this simple-minded person who just wants the simple life. And he wants to just settle down with Natasha and just be happy with her. Now, I have a couple of complaints as it's not a five star. First complaint is that second epilogue. Why does it exist? It does not need to exist. Secondly, um, I feel like the epilogue, the first epilogue, did a good job. I felt like the whole book was really good. I felt like it was important and it couldn't have been any shorter and it couldn't have been any longer, but it probably could have. I felt like it was just what it needed to be and I wouldn't throw away any of those extra scenes, even the war scenes, I wouldn't throw any of it away. But the epilogue, I didn't like very much. I liked Nikolai's and Mary's story, how it's explained in the epilogue, how they get together and how they have children and how they are the support for each other and how they're truly in love, which I think is something that you're rooting for something for Mary the whole time. At least I was. I just wanted Mary to be happy. I wanted her to have happiness at the end of her life. What's with the lighting? Anyways, 
And so that was something. But then Natasha's story in the epilogue, I really didn't like. And it was a big discussion in our book club, how Natasha is this vibrant, amazing, strong, independent woman for the whole book. And then in the epilogue, she turns into being solely there for the life of her children. And that was disappointing to read. But we all kind of came to the conclusion that she's still in there and she can come out eventually. But I think that Natasha turned into what Rep Tolstoy thinks of as the perfect woman who is just dedicated to her children and her husband and not to herself anymore. And I think that that's something where, yes, you need to be dedicated to your family, but you can also have interests of your own. And I think that that's a different time perspective, a different view on the world. So that's something I didn't really like about it. Um, otherwise, I think it was a very greatly, greatly done story and it definitely touched on time and history I didn't know anything about, really. I just knew that the Napoleonic War happened. I didn't know what it was about. I didn't know how it happened and I didn't realize how Russia was involved in it. So I am excited to learn more about that time and that era. Something else that I wanna talk about before I go, um, something that I was th I've been thinking about is how Tolstoy treats women. Now, Tolstoy has an interesting view of women in this book. They are either the goody two shoes or they are the ones who sleep around and are morally black. That's kind of how it looks. So first of all, you have Natasha and Mary who are on this good girl, angelic side, who they're not the same person, but they are definitely those, those good girls, those faithful ones, those true loves. They are dedicated to their family and to their friends. They are die hard supportive of their, of their loved ones. But then when Natasha is seduced by Anakov, Alakov, uh, she is starting to turn into this morally black character who is sleeping around and doesn't care about morals anymore. And that was something that was quickly switched and she quickly realized the error of her ways even it did impact her for many, many years socially. But she is still put into this box as someone who's trying to achieve that, which I think is a really bad view of women. And then on the other side, you have Helene who, she represents the French. She is so French and Natasha is so Russian in this book. If you were to put them into the countries, into nationalities, those would be the nationalities. But you have Helen who is seen as an adulteress. She's sleeping around with many people and she is not, not someone you wanna be with. And then Pierre is married to her, but he's in love with Natasha. And it was just an interesting, very outdated look on women and how women can be only angelic or evil and there's no in between. So I didn't really like that. But in light of reading Anna Karenina earlier this year, I could see how it started to change. Because Tolstoy's first book was War and Peace. His second book was Anna Karenina and he wrote that about 10 years later, maybe 15. But I could see that he had a different view of women later in life. But this one did not treat the women very well. It was very Victorian mentality of how women should behave in society. And I found that to be a very interesting dynamic. Also the whole Helene being the French embodiment in the book and Natasha being the Russian embodiment of the book. That's a video for another day if I wanna do another War and Peace video. Let me know down below if you'd like another War and Peace video. But basically, I liked it. I think it's a book that everyone should read. You might not enjoy it completely, but I think it's worth a read because you'll get something out of it, I am positive, even if it's a lot of hard work to read it. So thank you for watching this video. I know that War and Peace is a big bucket list book for, in terms of classics. So let me know if you've read it or if you're intrigued to read it down below. And if you'd like more videos on War and Peace because there are so many topics in this book. So thank you again for watching. I will see you next time in my next video. Bye for now.